Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video, I'm gonna walk you through the process of valuing Freeport McMoran stock so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. FCX is a mining company based in Phoenix, Arizona. They are the world's largest producer of molybdenum. They're also a major copper producer and they operate the world's largest gold mine. That's the Grassberg mine in Papua, Indonesia. If you're not familiar with molybdenum, it's a mineral that you need to stay healthy. Your body uses it to process proteins and genetic material like DNA. Molybdenum also breaks down drugs and toxic substances that enter the body. It's also common in steel. Structural steel accounts for 55% of molybdenum. You can also find it in pigments, fertilizer, lubricants, lots of things. FCX was created in 1981 through the merger of Freeport Minerals, formerly Texas Freeport Sulphur Company, and McMoran Oil and Gas Company, becoming Freeport McMoran. Although their predecessor companies date back to 1912, because Freeport Sulphur was founded on July 12, 1912. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 57 billion market cap. They're trading at $39 a share and they have 1.4 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see their free cash flow grew a ton from 1 billion to 5.6 billion. That's kind of their sweet spot, 5 billion. But as you know, free cash flow gets dragged down by CapEx. So if the company's investing a lot back into their business, like they did in 2022 in the trailing 12 months, then their free cash flow is a lot lower. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And revenue was low in 2020 due to COVID only 900 million of net income. Then it jumped right back up to 5 billion. It dropped to 4 billion, then dropped to 3 billion. Net income is a profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that jumped up a lot from 14 billion to almost 23 billion. Then it declined a little bit to 22.8 billion, then 21.6 billion. Let's take a look at their latest 10Q. This is as of 331, 2023. And the first financial statement is their balance sheet. 6.9 billion of cash compared to 8.1 billion from last year. Let's get a little more info on this 6.9 billion. Of the 6.9 billion, 300 million is time deposits. A time deposit is money in a bank account that cannot be withdrawn until a certain time. So they probably have a CD, maybe a one or two year CD. So they have to wait for the maturity of the CD before they get those funds. Below that is 1.1 billion of accounts receivable. So they sold products on credit, but didn't receive payment. They're going to receive that payment sometime in the future. 550 million of income tax receivables. These are taxes the company expects to receive from the government sometime in the near future. Then below that is inventory. 2 billion of materials and supplies. Another 1.4 billion of inventory and another 2.2 billion. They do provide a little more detail on the inventory. Here's a more thorough breakdown of their inventory. Here's a 2 billion of materials and supplies. Mill stockpiles, 222 million. When a company mines product, like when they mine copper, they have to put it somewhere. They stockpile it somewhere before they process it. That's what mill stockpiles is. It's just a product sitting there in a big warehouse. Leach stockpiles, are ore or rock, but they're in liquid form or about to be converted into liquid form. So total current mill and leach stockpiles 1.4 billion. Then they have raw materials, which is mainly concentrate 400 million. Concentrate is the fundamental raw material used to make copper. Then you have work in process. Work in process is between raw material and finished product. And then you have finished product, which is what they can sell. 1.6 billion. They also have long-term inventories on their balance sheet. 200 million of mill stockpiles and 1 billion of leach stockpiles for 1.2 billion. I'll show you that in the balance sheet. Here's the 1.2 billion in non-current assets. 
So they have 15 billion of current assets and they have 5.3 billion of current liabilities. So they can cover their current liabilities with their current assets almost three times. That means their current ratio is about three, which is really high. TP&E 33 billion. They own land, real estate, machinery, and that's all part of PP&E. And that gets depreciated each year, except the land. Land does not get depreciated. Then you have other assets, 1.8 billion. Total assets, 51 billion, similar to last year. Let's look at their liabilities. Accounts payable, 3.8 billion. That's how much they owe other companies for buying on credit. 846 million of accrued income taxes. These are taxes the company will eventually pay, but are not due yet. They owe 333 million in asset retirement obligations. They owe 217 million of dividend payments. These are the payments owed to their investors. They owe 49 million on the current portion of the long-term debt. So total current liabilities, 5.3 billion. They owe 10 billion on long-term debt. Here's a breakdown of their debt. 6.2 billion issued by Freeport McMoran. They call their operation in Indonesia PT-FI, PT Freeport Indonesia. It's a way to separate the company to track things easier. They owe 3 billion of debt on their Indonesia operation, 354 million of Freeport Minerals Corp, and 71 million of other. So total debt 9.6 billion. The current portion is 49 million. The long-term portion is 9.6 billion. Here's some info on their share repurchase program. Since mid-2021, we acquired 47.8 million shares of common stock under the repurchase program for a total cost of 1.8 billion. So they paid $38.35 per share, including 12.3 million shares in the first quarter of 2022 for a cost of 541 million. No shares have been repurchased since July 2022. As of May 2023, we have $3.2 billion available for repurchases under the program. They owe $4.5 billion on an environmental and asset retirement obligation, $4.3 billion of deferred income taxes, and $1.6 billion of other. So total liability is $25 billion. Let's look at their equity section. They raised $25 billion from selling their business. They lost $3 billion from running their business. The reason it's negative is because accumulated deficit is a sum of all their prior net incomes minus the sum of all the dividends they paid out. And they paid out a lot in dividends. And they have 5.8 billion in treasury stock. These are the shares they bought back. Total equity 16 billion. Non-controlling interest of 10 billion. Non-controlling interest is where a shareholder owns less than 50% of this company. So they don't have a controlling interest. They probably own 10, 20%. If they own more than 50%, they'd be a controlling interest. And if they own less than 1%, it wouldn't be on the balance sheet. You own less than 1% if you own this stock. You probably own 0.0001% or something like that. I think the non-controlling interest entity is their Indonesia operation. So their equity is 25 billion. Their liabilities are 25 billion. Liabilities plus equity is 50 billion, which equals their assets of 50 billion. So we can now rest at night knowing the balance sheet balances. Let's take a look at their income statement. Revenue of 5.4 billion down from 6.6 .6 billion. Revenue is highly influenced by commodity prices. If for instance, copper prices triple, their revenue will go through the roof. And if copper prices went down 50%, their revenue will go down a lot. I think it's really important to understand what feeds into the revenue. Because a lot of people invest in companies and they don't really know how they generate revenue. They think they know, but sometimes you're way off. So most of their revenue is from copper. 1.6 billion in copper concentrate, 1.3 billion in cathode, 900 million in rod and other refined copper products, and 200 million of purchased copper. And they footnote that, FCX purchases copper cathode primarily for processing by its rod and refining operations. Cathode is a form of copper. It has a purity of 99.95%. Because some companies prefer FCX do all the work, all the smelting, everything to turn the cathode or concentrate into a rod or other refined copper product. While other companies just want the cathode or concentrate and they'll do the last steps of the process. Molybdenum 
about 600 million, gold 500 million, and other 133 million. And the other mainly includes revenues from silver. So you can see the main reason their revenue went down from last year was from concentrate. It was 2.7 billion, now it's 1.6 billion. Here's copper futures the last two years. So you can see prices were much higher at the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022. Then there was a big crash in mid-2022. The price has come up from the bottom, but still it's a lot cheaper now than it was last year, which is why their revenue was higher last year than this year. But that's just copper. Molybdenum actually went up from last year. Gold is down from last year and silver is down from last year. They spent 3.2 billion producing and delivering the commodity, 400 million of depreciation, depletion, and amortization. So the cost of sales is 3.6 billion, which is almost identical to last year. So their margins are much lower because their revenue has come down a lot from last year. So they probably sold a similar amount of product, a similar amount of quantity, but they sold it for a cheaper price this year than last year. Then you have SGNA 126 million, that includes payroll for certain functions, also marketing, 39 million in exploration and research, 67 million in environmental and shutdown costs. Because sometimes they have to clean up an area which costs them a lot of money, and other times they have to shut down an area. And the shutdown costs include care and maintenance costs, litigation, remediation, or related expenses associated with closing the facilities. So their operating income is down a lot from 2.8 billion to 1.6 billion. They spent 151 million of interest on their debt, up from 127 million. Other income of 88 million. Income before taxes, 1.5 billion. Half a billion of taxes. Net income of 1 billion. That gives them an earnings per share of 46 cents compared to 105 last year. Their shares outstanding have decreased from 1.45 billion to 1.43 billion. This page talks about the volatility of commodity prices. Prices for copper, gold, and molybdenum can fluctuate significantly. From 2013 to 2023, the price varied from a buck 96 to 487. That's per pound of copper. Gold fluctuated from 1,000 to 2,000 per ounce. And molybdenum, a low of 446 a pound to 37 a pound. That's a really big spread. This red line is the price of copper. It was highest in 2022. The price is still a lot higher than pre-2021, even though it has come down about 10-20% from the peak last year. Gold prices are within 10% of their 10-year high. Before COVID, gold prices were usually below 1400 2016 was a low of 1050 Molybdenum is doing amazing. It was really high at the end of 2022, but it has come down a bit in 2023. It's still more than double pre-COVID levels. Let's look at their statement of cash flows. The statement of cash flows has three sections, operating, investing, and financing. First, we look at operating. The way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net income, one billion. You add back the non-cash items on the income statement. Depreciation and amortization is the biggest. Then you adjust for changes in working capital. So it looks like they paid for 457 million of inventory. That's a cash outflow. But when they use the inventory, when they sell it, it'll be a cash inflow in that accounting period. So their operating cash flow is pretty much identical to their net income. In their investing section, they had a cash outflow of 1.2 billion. That's mainly from CapEx in North America mines, 200 million, South America, 100 million, Indonesia, 449 million, Indonesia smelter projects, 300 million, molybdenum, 9 million, and other 44 million. They pay back 24 million of loans and an outflow of 19 million of other. That's how we get to $1.2 billion. In the financing section is the equity debt and dividends. They received 284 million of debt. They paid back 1.3 billion of debt. They paid 217 million of dividends on common stock. So they had a cash outflow of 1.2 billion. Last year, they had a cash outflow of 700 million. Last year, they bought back 541 million of stock. This year, they didn't buy back any. Let's look at their first quarter earnings slides. They produced 965 million pounds of copper. That was in the first quarter of 2023. They sold 830 million for a price of 411 per pound. 
For gold, produced 405,000 ounces, sold 270,000 for a price of 1949. Molybdenum, they produced 21 million pounds, sold 19 million at a cost of 30 per pound. Adjusted EBITDA 2.2 billion, operating cash flow 1.1 billion, and net debt 1.3 billion. The reason sometimes my numbers differ a little, you'll never see my revenue differ from their revenue because revenue can't really be adjusted. But sometimes on my Excel file, my net debt may be different from theirs or maybe my free cash flow may be different from theirs is because companies like to do a lot of adjustments. Like one adjustment they noted was they excluded the net debt for smelter projects. They probably excluded other things. A lot of times the company gives you adjusted numbers. My Excel file is not adjusted for anything. Here's their monthly copper production. March was their best month in Grassburg. That's their biggest location. Cerro Verde is up 13% from a prior month to 87 million pounds. U.S. copper is up 18% to 116 million. It was higher in January at 118 million. That's due to labor shortages. Also extreme weather events and equipment issues. The demand for copper in 2022 is 25 million tons. It's supposed to double by 2035. If that does happen, this company will benefit a lot from that increase. They think it's going to increase so much because of renewables. A lot of the infrastructure, like to build charging stations for EV cars, a lot of that infrastructure is copper. They use so much copper to make the infrastructure for solar panels, for charging stations, for batteries, for electric cars. There's so much copper used. Copper reserves 111 billion pounds, 44% in North America, 28% in Indonesia, 28% in South America. Copper resources 235 billion pounds, 53% North America, 21% Indonesia, 26% South America. They are killing it in molybdenum. EBITDA 400 million, operating cash flow 375 million. And this is a tiny part of their business and it makes up a pretty good chunk of their operating cash flow because their total operating cash flow is 1.1 billion and 375 million comes from this one product. And Freeport McMoran is number one in molybdenum. Here's their copper sales estimate, 4.1 billion pounds in 2023, 4.2 billion in 2024 and 2025. Their gold estimates, this is in ounces, 1.8 million this year, next year 1.8 million, then after that 1.6 million. Molybdenum, they call it molly. Have you gone clubbing and used molly? I'm referring to molybdenum, right? 79 million pounds in 2023, 85 million pounds in 2024, and 90 million in 2025. CapEx is a really important thing to look at. I'm sure you're aware of that from watching this channel. They project to spend 3.5 billion this year in CapEx, 3.3 billion next year. And that's excluding their Indonesia smelter projects. I think they're excluding Indonesia because it's a separate entity. And since they're a non-controlling interest, it would be double counting if they included the CapEx for Indonesia. That's what I think. But let me know in the comments if you think any differently. Here are some financial highlights. 832 million pounds of copper, which is down from last year of 1 billion. They charge 411 this year, last year 466. And it costs more money to make it. It cost 257 this year, last year 203. This 176 cash costs, that is a 257 minus depreciation and amortization. Gold 270,000 ounces down from last year of 409,000, but they charge a little more this year than last year for gold. Molybdenum, same amount of pounds, but they charge $19 last year. This year they're charging $30. That's a big improvement for Mali. Revenue 5.4 billion, down from 6.6 .6 billion. Net income 700 million, down from 1.5 billion. EPS of 46 cents, down from 104. Operating cash flow 1.1 billion, down from 1.7. CapEx is up from 700 million to 1.1 billion. Total debt is flat at 9.6 billion. Here's when their debt matures, 700 million, of senior notes maturing next year, interest rate 4.5%, 1.4 billion of debt, part of it is a 4.8% senior note, and part of it is a 5% senior note. Then in 2028, 1 billion of senior notes, 
four and one eighths percent and four and three eighths percent. 6.5 billion of debt due thereafter between 5.3 and 6.2 percent and then a lot of different notes as low as 4.25 percent as high as five and a half percent. Here's their copper sales estimate for this year. They did 830 million pounds of copper this year. They project 1 billion in the second and third quarter, 1.1 billion in the fourth quarter. For gold sales, they only did 270,000 ounces in the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter, around 500,000 ounces. Molybdenum, they expect 20 million pounds the next three quarters. Here's how they calculate the EBITDA of 2.2 billion. You start with your earnings, which is the E part, 663 million. Then you add back the I, interest, 151 million. Then you add back the T, taxes, 499 million. Then you add back the DA, depreciation and amortization, 399 million. Since they use the word adjusted, they also add back other things like stock-based compensation, net charges, other income, non-controlling interest, equity earnings. So that's how they get to 2.2 billion. Let's go back to my Excel model. This is their capital structure, 16 billion of equity, 10 billion of debt. They're 62% equity, 38% debt. Their net debt is 2.8 billion. That means they have about 7 billion of cash on their balance sheet. I gave them a whack of 9.5% and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 83 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $74 billion. We divide that by 1.4 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $51. They're trading at $39. So they're trading at a 23% discount. It's a buy according to the model. They pay a quarterly dividend and it's up to 15 cents. That's a yield of 1.5%, which is 24% of their net income. But their free cash flow is low due to high CapEx. So it's 136% of their free cash flow. There are six companies in the same industry as FCX. And if they have a number in red, they're worse than the median. If they have a number in blue, they're better. They spend a ton in CapEx, 3.6 billion. That's more than the other five companies combined. A good debt to equity ratio for every dollar of equity, they have 60 cents of debt, better than the median average. They pay a good dividend, a lot lower than SCCO, but most companies don't pay a dividend on this list. They do generate positive free cash flow, higher than the average of median, but a lot lower than SCCO. This company and Southern Copper have the highest market cap by far of the six companies. I'm not sure how you can have a negative market cap. This must be an error on the website I pulled this from. Their price to book is pretty close to the average. They have a good PE, 15.6. To calculate this number, it's market cap over earnings or stock price over earnings per share. They didn't generate that much free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, so their price to free cash flow is pretty weak at 90. They have a good price to sales of 2.6 right in the median. They generate the most revenue of any company on this list more than double Southern Copper. Their five-year annual revenue growth rate is only 4%. Southern Copper is 8%. Let's look at the stock on Simply Wall Street. The last trading price is $39, market cap of 56 billion. It's down 1.6% in the past week, up 26% in the past year. Simply Wall Street values the stock exactly where they're trading at. 20 analysts price the stock and the average price target is 46. They say the stock is 17% undervalued. They forecast their revenue to hit 25 billion by 2025 and 24 and a half billion in 2024. And they project a crazy high free cash flow growth by 2025, over 7 billion. It's under 1 billion currently. By the end of this year, they expect almost 3 billion. Next year, 4.6 billion. Their trailing 12 month revenue in mid 2012 was 18 billion. By mid 2014, it got up to 23 billion. Then it dropped to 13 billion in 2016, 20 billion in 2018, down to 13 billion in 2020. But it got to its highest point at almost 25 billion in the first quarter of 2022. This is trailing 12 months. So the 25 billion is the last three quarters of 2021 plus the first quarter of 2022. This red line is their debt. The blue line is their equity. 
In 2012, they only had three and a half billion of debt. It got up to 21 billion in 2013. So it has come down since 2013. It's down to under 10 billion and their equity has come up a lot. Here's their dividend yield since 2012. It was three and a half percent in 2012. It was over 6% in 2014. They didn't pay a dividend from September 2015 to October 2017. They brought it back and it was 2% at the end of 2019. Then they cut it in 2020. They did bring it back in 2021. It peaked at 2% in mid-2022. And the forecast is for the yield to be only 1.4% by 2025. The CEO's salary is $1.8 million and total compensation over 20 million. In the past year, there's been three insider buys and one sell. 81% of the companies held by institutions, 19% by the general public, and one half of 1% by insiders. Their biggest shareholders is Vanguard at 8%, then BlackRock, Fidelity, Capital Research, State Street, and several more companies. Their employee count has gone down over the year as it was 34,000 in 2012. It's currently 25,600. The ticker trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Deutsche Börse, Mexican Bolsa, Zitra, Santiago Stock Exchange, Swiss, London Stock Exchange, Lima Bolsa, the Wiener Bourse, Euro TLX, the Kazakhstan Stock Exchange, Buenos Aires, and Sao Paulo Bolsa. Let's look at the stock on Yahoo Finance. It closed at 39.77, 57 billion market cap. The one year price target is $46. It looks like the stock started trading in 1995. It got really low in 2001, probably from the dot com crash. And it had a huge bull run up through 2008. It got close to $65 a share. Then the Great Recession occurred and it came way down to under $10. Then from 2009 to 2011, it got right back up to over $60. It fell a ton from 2011 to 2016. It got down to about $3 or $4. It came up to over $20 in 2018. Then in 2020, it came right back down to under $5. Then by April 2020, it broke through $50. It fell below $30. Now it's sitting around $40. In the first quarter of 2022, their market cap was over $70 billion. It almost got cut in half to the third quarter of 2022 under 40 billion. It has come up since the bottom, sitting around 56 billion. They have a pretty high beta. It's a pretty volatile stock, a beta of two. So the stock moves two times the market. It's up 26% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 17%. 52 week low 25, the high is 47. And the stock is on an uptick, trading above its 50 day and 200 day moving average. Lots of activity, over 12 million shares are traded each day on this stock. All the shares outstanding are on flow, 81% are held by institutions. Only 1.5% of the shares are shorted. I hope you like my new video format, a lot longer, a lot more information. Let me know what you think, give the video a like, subscribe, or comment below. If you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.